Hi everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. First, we just want to say that we hope you and your loved ones are staying healthy and safe. We're releasing this podcast the weekend of March 15th, 2020, and we know that a lot of people are worried about or even directly facing scary circumstances right now. We hope that by continuing to publish content that Faith Matters can be a bit of spiritual nourishment during an uncertain time. In this episode, Terrell sits down with his good friend, Judge Thomas Griffith. Thomas has had a fascinating career in the highest levels of power in Washington, D.C., but politics takes a back seat as Terrell and Tom explore what really matters most. Their conversation covers a lot of interesting ground, and we hope you enjoy it. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Terrell Givens. I'm the host, and uh, this is a podcast sponsored by the Faith Matters organization, and my guest with us today is Thomas Griffith, a federal judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Did I get that right? You got it right. It's a mouthful. Okay. And uh, bring us up to date a little bit with you, your career, um, some of your prior experience that led to you getting to the post that you hold today. And tell us a little bit about how, if Americans had heard the name Thomas Griffith, oh, say, what, 20 or so years ago now? Why why might that have been the case? Well, they would be Americans who were obsessed with the impeachment trial of President Clinton. And it turned out there weren't that many uh, that were <laughs> obsessed with it. But I played a, a minor uh, role in the impeachment trial of President Clinton. I was the uh, held a position called Senate Legal Counsel. It's the chief legal officer of the United States Senate. It's a nonpartisan position. Usually doesn't have a very big role to play in American politics. Uh, that's right. That's right. It's an interesting job. It's a fascinating job. You're representing the Senate as an institution in the courts and in and, and, and other capacities. Uh, but during the impeachment trial of, of uh, President Clinton, uh, my office played the nonpartisan role of counsel uh, for the entire Senate, for the Democrats and the Republicans. And in that capacity, uh, Senator Trent Lott was the majority leader. He, he asked me if I would be willing to be the one to go uh, and meet with the pundits and be interviewed. So um, I found myself uh, being interviewed uh, by various uh, media outlets and sitting in green rooms and having makeup put on my face. I, I think the only people who, who remember that or watched were my, <laughs> uh, my family. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was, that was my, but, but it, 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 uh, it led directly to, uh, my present appointment in that, um, uh, in that capacity, I got to know lots of United States senators. Right. Uh, and, uh, when, uh, uh President Bush, uh, nominated me for this court, I, I don't know, but I'm assuming that part of the calculation was that, uh, I had, I, I had friends, Right. Uh, on both sides of the aisle, coming out of that time as Senate legal counsel. So, so you're the highest ranking um, judicial of official in the LDS church? No, no, we don't, no, no, we don't get into those games. We don't think about that, that at all. We have, a, we have, a, uh, we, we are uh, well represented in the federal judiciary with uh, okay. uh, wonderful Latter-day Saints. And you, uh, you've had, you have some experience with Brigham Young University as well in your uh, legal. Yeah, uh, immediately prior to the time uh, that I was appointed to the D.C. Circuit, I was the uh, general counsel at, uh, at, at BYU. Okay. And uh, that was a great job. I love that good job. That was a yeah. wonderful job. BYU, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm a fan of BYU's. I attended at BYU as an undergraduate. Um, and to go back there in the administration, uh, to be on campus amongst the students, to deal with the uh, interesting legal issues we had. And uh, the only downside of it was that uh, the sports teams didn't do particularly well <laughs> during the time when I had access to great tickets. But well, they, uh, they, they got better. Yes. So uh, a committed member of the church, but not a lifelong member. No, I'm a, I'm a convert to the church. Uh, I joined the church as a junior in high school in McLean, Virginia, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C., and at one time you wore the false robes of an apostate priesthood. Is that right? No, that's not. That's not true. That's not true. I was an Almost. acolyte. I was an acolyte. I thought you wore robes as an acolyte. I, you wore robes, but uh, I, I won't go with the false part. Okay. Uh, no, I was. Uh, uh, my family. We belong to uh, uh, St. John's Church in McLean, Virginia. It's an Episcopal church in McLean, and um, I. Uh, I was an acolyte, uh, an altar boy. Um, uh, now it's altar boys and girls, uh, but at the time acolytes were just, uh, males. And I did that for a couple of years. Uh, I think it was 14, 15 years old or so. Um, and, uh, um, as it turns out that experience had a much greater influence on me than I probably thought 
at the time. Um, I, I did it in large measure because I wanted to uh, please my parents, particularly my father. That was it was meaningful to him. So uh, I went along with it. You, you, you would not have mistaken me for devout or pious at all. I was interested in things right, religious, right. but uh, uh, seeking for holiness and having a prayer life, or, I didn't have any, any, any of those. But, um, but it turned out to be a really meaningful experience to me that I think I only began to appreciate uh, many, so, years later, many years later. Yeah, I've teased you in times past. Yes. You're an Episcopalian who happens to believe in the Book of Mormon. You say that a lot. You say that a lot. And uh, there's probably some truth to it. Um, uh, I, uh, I, but but my, my Anglican roots, I didn't appreciate them until more recently uh, in, 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 in life. And that, in fact, I thought in, in some of my naivete or foolishness as a, as a 16 year old, I, 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 I think I viewed my conversion as part form of rebellion. Um, uh, you know, what a way to rebel, right. <laughs> to become a Latter-day Saint. But I, I think I viewed it as, as rebellion. And I think now uh, with a little uh, more experience in hindsight, no, it wasn't active rebellion. It was actually um, uh, a, a, a fulfillment, uh, 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 an enlargement. That's the yeah. right word. There, there's a continuity between uh, my my experience, particularly as an acolyte, and and my conversion and my life now. So, do you miss the high church ritual? I do, I do. Yeah, I I enjoy that. And I uh, why are Mormons so hostile to ritual? Um, you know, I don't know. You'd have to ask. Um, Sociology and religion, though, right? I mean, the, the explanation I've always heard, but I've had some es- experts about it, is that um, the earliest converts to the Restoration uh, were Methodists. Uh, well, they came out of Methodism or Puritans and, and uh, um, sort of a rebellion against uh, uh, high church uh, uh, liturgy. Um, I've, always, I've always, when I when I was participating in it, I didn't find it as meaningful as I do now. Yeah. And so on occasion, uh, when I have the time and availability, I, I will uh, uh, enjoy an evensong service at the Westminster at, at anywhere. National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. is beautiful. I, I think you and I have gone to uh, uh, to evensong at Christ Church Cathedral in Oxford. Uh, so, you know, I, I, there's a part of me that uh, that that appeals to a, a, a great deal. Having said that, um, I, I love Latter-day Saint worship. I, I love our uh, emphasis on spoken word, personal narrative, uh, personal testimony. I love the uh, uh, democratization of it, that everyone gets a chance to speak and you hear from all sorts of different perspectives. So I, I, I love that. I'm comfortable with that. It's changed my life, I, uh, and, and hopefully it does continually. But there's a part of me that it, that still enjoys uh, the high church uh, liturgy. So I want to ask you to take us through your entire conversion experience. But but can you okay. can you single out one pivotal moment, one pivotal moment that yeah. on which your conversion hinged? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm uh, typically reluctant to, to speak about this, and now you've got me on a, a video cast talking about it. And the reason I'm reluctant to speak about it is because it's so it's so unusual that I, I fear. Uh, particularly in my dealing in my teaching experience in the church and dealing with high school and college age students, that they may think that this is a, a norm, that this is what has to happen. Yeah. Uh, 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 but it was an unusual experience. I uh, uh, I was invited to attend uh, an early morning seminary class um, in the McLean Ward back in Northern Virginia, and at the end of the class, the instructor, the only name. Ivan Keller um, handed me a copy of the Book of Mormon and um, showed me Moroni's promise and the beginning of it. And uh, I took it off to school that day. Um, went to my first class. Uh, it's a class that I normally sat in the front of the class and was really obnoxious. Uh, I was arrogant and outspoken and uh uh, that's where I, that was my normal perch. Uh, but this day I decided to sit in the back of the class. It was actually a large lecture class, 120 people or so. I sat in the back of the class and I opened the textbook and I slid uh, this copy of the Book of Mormon inside. And I uh, leafed through the pages, looking at the pictures, the Arnold Freebird pictures. They were interspersed throughout the text. 
which I think we ought to resort to, I think, at least based on my experience, because it got me into the text. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, I'm you know, looking at these strange scenes that weren't familiar at all to me. <clears throat> I got to the one that I now know of as the, uh, uh, the Lord touching the stones for the brother of Jared. And if you recall the picture, it's very strange. It's strange headgear on. The lighting is rather arresting. And, <clears throat> and I remember stopping there looking at that and then starting decided to read the text on the other side of the page. And I, I don't remember what the text was. It might have been a genealogy of ether or something for all I know. I, I, don't, I don't remember. But, but as I began to read, something unusual happened to me that had never happened before and has never happened since in quite the same way. But uh, I had this uh, overwhelming feeling of joy, um, a feeling of excitement, um, I had the sense that what I was reading was ancient, that it was the record of real people, that it, uh, it, it confirmed the trustworthiness of the biblical account, generally, uh, and that the rest of my life was going to be tied up with this book. Now, um, that was pretty <laughs> heavy experience to have. Um, uh, sitting in the back of my American civilization class. Um, uh, but I came out of that experience convinced that I needed to learn more about the church that was the custodian of this. And you did. This record, yeah. Well, let me see if I can use uh, something that you once quoted from Ross Dothat as a, as a bridge to okay. what happened subsequently. Yeah. You quote the, the, the columnist as saying, the Christian story is not theology or commandments or a roadmap. It recounts a series of events that, if real, tell us something profound about the nature of God and his relationship to his creatures. It reminds me a little bit of David Bentley Hart, who right. talks about the, the, the radical intrusion of Christ into history. History has been invaded <clears throat> by God and Christ. Right. Yeah. So what, does, what, what did your engagement with Latter-day Saintism... Uh, Change, add to that, or did it did it reinterpret that? In other words, once that has happened, yeah. what was the need for something subsequent to that to unfold? Yeah. Well, to me, um, the reason I, I like the Dothot quote is because it describes my view of my credo, my reason for being committed uh, to the to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Um, uh, I think something happened <laughs> that in between 1823 and 1827, something happened. Um, uh, I believe that an angel appeared to this boy and gave him golden plates that he translated miraculously. Um, I think that really happened. And uh, I'm a, I'm a skeptic by nature. Uh, I'm the one that when someone in church talks about, having lost their keys and praying for it and finding it. My, my initial reaction to that is I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Now, having said that, when I lose my keys, pray I, I, pray, I pray for it. But, but, my, but, you know, my name is Thomas, after all, and my inclination is not to believe. And so uh, this is an audacious story of angel, gold plates, miraculous translation. Um, but... Over the years, quite apart from that initial experience that I've had, because that initial experience I've had, it's, it's, it's pretty easy for someone like me, at least, to, to find ways around that, to imagine, though, that was, I don't know, something was going on emotionally with me. It's easy, it'd be easy for me to talk myself out of, out of that. Um, for me the story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and then the text itself and its complexity, its profundity, its, its, uh, its, uh, its ties to the ancient world. It, it, they're anachronisms to be sure, right? There. But, but uh, the large picture of it is, um, I can't come up with a better explanation for its origin than the audacious one. Um, and, and, in, and in many ways, this is getting back to Dothat now, I, I think it's, it's quite parallel to the original uh, Christian witness. I mean, um, it just recharges it after 2000 years. It, exactly. Of and, and, it, and, it, and it's similar in the following way. They both rely on the tangible. 
the objective. I mean, the claim of the early disciples was not just a visionary claim of the risen Lord. It's the bodily resurrection touching and feeling. I mean, and N.T. Wright has written about this persuasively and effectively, that it's the, it's the bodily resurrection of Christ that was what drove and animated the earliest Christians because it was history being invaded by God and Christ, not, not visionary. Uh, and, and so I think, I think that the gold plates and the story surrounding coming forth the Book of Mormon serve the same purpose for Latter-day Saint Christianity as the bodily resurrection of Jesus does for um, first century uh, Christianity. Okay, let's, let's, let's push that a little bit further. Um, you've, you've written very movingly about the uh, appearance of the resurrected Christ in the New World. Recounted in right. Third Nephi. Right. Um, so I want to read something that, that that I've written and see if how that connects to uh, to your okay. insights about Christ's resurrection. I've I've observed that that when Thomas is invited to feel the wounds of the of the resurrected Christ in the Book of Luke, that he came to know the persisting reality of Jesus Christ, his lived presence in the world, when he actually felt his wounds. And I think there's a logical symmetry here that we only know Christ, really know him to the extent that we know what his love for us cost him. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is the primary mode by which Christ knows us and engages us, which is by our wounds, mm -hmm. by feeling our wounds, yeah, which yeah. is what we think in some way happened right. in, in his working out of the atonement. And that would seem to be the meaning of his words, I have graven you upon my palms. We know him by his wounds as he knows us mm -hmm. by ours. So how does that relate to your reading of Christ's appearance and yeah. what happens in the immediate aftermath? Yeah. Well, I, so again, I come back to it's the, it's the physical, it's the material um, uh, witness that, that energizes my faith. And, and I think you have in the story of 3 Nephi 11, um, just a, a really powerful demonstration of, of that. Um, and let me tell you, let me give, let me back up a little bit more to tell you how I got to the view I, I, I have now. It came out, uh, I had a church calling at the time where I, I presided over, uh, we now call them a young single adult stake, it was then called a BYU campus stake. There's a remarkable group of young people. I mean, it, mostly upperclassmen, uh, I don't remember the numbers, but I think I think over you know ninety percent of the males were returned missionaries, and I think even like over forty percent of the young women. And this was before the age change, so it was really a remarkable uh, group of young people. Um, and as a you know as a campus stake president, you, you can imagine I worried about the things that uh, anyone worries about when they have stewardship for for uh, young single adults. Uh, but but what I really worried about. Um, was the temple recommend interview question that I've never in, in the years as a bishop or as a state president, I've never had anyone pause or hesitate about this question at all. Do you have a testimony of the atonement of Christ and of his role as savior and redeemer? Everyone just says yes, right? It, my concern was whether that was genuine. Uh, was it genuine with me? Was it genuine with, um, with the members of my state? Um, and so I can remember one day, you know, reading everyone's favorite passage in 3 Nephi 11, where Christ, the risen uh, Lord, visits the people in, uh, in, in Bountiful. And, uh, and here's what struck me about that. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to unpack in there, but here's what struck me on that occasion. So th this is the righteous remnant, right? And these are the folks who are more righteous than, than those who are no longer around. And, uh, and so I, I imagine that that was talking about those who are faithful and participating and trying temple direct trying to or, or equivalent to that. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's curious in, in the, it's at least curious to me in the account that's given, he comes, he descends in this dramatic fashion, descends from heaven, comes in the midst of them. And the author of the account tells us that the people fell on the ground, just as they fell on the ground. It doesn't say why Now we can imagine why it's, an awesome experience, might have been afraid, might, there might have been peer pressure, but they, but they fell to the ground. And then, then the Lord commands them to arise and to come forth one by one and to do something that is odd to 
most sensibilities to touch the wounds, the scars that he had in his hands, feet, and side. And, and as I read it, th- there wasn't a invitation. It was a command that yet they had to do it. Uh, that's an awfully intimate sort of encounter with, with scars of Christ's suffering, the emblems of his suffering. And so, so they, they, they do that. And then comes what I think is a really remarkable thing. It, the author tells us they all, they cried out, Hosanna, which I understand means save us now. Well, that seems curious to me. These, weren't these people already saved? Apparently not. Apparently there was something about that experience that they had with the Lord that triggered that immediate reaction, save us now. So that I, I'm, I'm reading into that, that there was a deficit in their prior uh, experience that was now being filled with this, the immediacy of touching the, the wounds. But then, then they cry out, save us now. And then it says they all fell to the ground and worshiped him. That phrase isn't in the description of the first time they fell to the ground. And so from that, I try and make the idea, and I think it works, is that um, the worship of Christ, the adoration of the Savior, comes most powerfully, most directly, from the fact that they had physical contact with the emblems of his suffering. There was something about that experience that was transformative to this good group of people. And so the way I like to, I'm teaching this lesson, say these were, you know, good folks going to church, doing the things that faithful people do before, but there was something lacking. They hadn't yet had at some level this experience of having this transformative worshipful experience with Christ's suffering, right? Um, and then it dawned on me. So, so I'm, you know, thinking about this is you know, how do you implement this? Well, okay, well we have Christ. This sounds blasphemous. We have Christ appear at the stake, and then, uh, and then it dawned on me. No, we we actually have that experience every week of, of having physical contact with the emblems of its suffering, and that's that's the sacrament, right? It's the sacrament, and so um, so I think that's that's what I do. That's what I get out of third Nephi 11. There's a lot more there, but I think there's something. I, about- I wonder to what extent your sensibility was shaped by your religious background. Well, see, that's what I'm getting to. I think, I think perhaps it was, I think. Uh, I remember going to a, a, a Eucharist, a, 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 a yeah. mass with a Catholic friend. And uh, at the end of it, I said, so that, that was it. That's as a Catholic, it's just, you just go to mass. Yeah. And, and and he was kind of incredulous. He says, "Well, that that's everything, yeah. right? That's yeah. everything." And at the time, I didn't understand that. Yeah. But if I see it through the prism that you just constructed for yeah. us, that makes a lot more sense. And and, and, I, and as I've gotten older, I think I, I think there is a direct connection between my experience as an acolyte and 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 my current view. Um, when I was an acolyte helping the priest with the Eucharist with Holy Communion. As I said, I, I, you wouldn't mistake me for pious or devout. Yeah, I sensed some. There was there was a holiness there. There was something. There was something going on there that meant a great deal to me. Now, with your, your thought, with your experience with your Catholic friend, try this out. So, uh, a good friend of mine years ago uh, had a had a suggestion for what wards ought to do with the sacrament that I never had the courage to do as either a bishop or stake president because I was afraid I'd get released, I guess. But here, here's the idea. The idea is that um, at the end of church one Sunday, the bishop stands up and announces to the ward that next Sunday, next Sunday, church is going to be a little bit different. We're only going to have sacrament meeting. That's all we're going to have. We're not going to have any other meetings. There'll be no bishopric meetings. There'll be no presidency meetings. There'll be no choir practice, nothing. It's just sacrament meeting. That's it, nothing else. And here's what sacrament meeting is going to look like, says the bishop. We're going to assemble in the chapel. We're going to sing a hymn. We're going to take the sacrament and we're going to go home. That's it. And the idea behind it is tear down all the scaffolding and see 
what the heart of the experience is. And then maybe with that view, when we come back the next time, we'll see that everything else is scaffolding. Everything else needs to be directly related to that experience that we've just shared one with another in the, the sacrament of the, uh, of the Lord's Supper. Okay, this leads to my next question, okay. which you've, you've already kind of partially answered. Um, I, I remember hearing a story, it may have come from you, President Hinckley saying on one occasion, how can we get this gospel of yeah. Jesus Christ down into the hearts of the people. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking. The phrase was, we, we need to do a better job oh, okay. of getting it down. Yeah. And clearly we do. Um, it, it strikes me that, um, you know, we can, we can argue about the terminology, but we're hurting right now as a church, right? We're losing thousands and thousands of our best and brightest. And it, it strikes me that if any of them had had an experience comparable to Thomas feeling the wounds or the Nephites, mm -hmm. they wouldn't leave because they have questions about horses in the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. So how have we gone so wrong or how have we been so deficient in constructing the bases on which Latter-day Saints claim membership or discipleship? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a tough question, and and I, uh, I'm not certain I like the lead up that I'm now going to comment on deficiencies, <laughs> <laughs> uh, way above, uh, way above okay, my. Okay, so what, what can we do better? Yeah, well, I, that, this is one of them. I think I think um, it's, it's, a laser like intensity on the sacrament. I, so uh, I, I, another experience that was formative to me in this is uh, when I first joined the church. I, I was ordained a priest, which just boggled my mind. I, I didn't realize that was going to come with it. I held priests in such high regard because of my sure. experience as an Anglican that now this 16-year-old is going to be a priest was a bit overwhelming. Um, we had a large uh, priest quorum uh, such that um, you, you wouldn't bless the sacrament every Sunday, but maybe every third Sunday or so. So I had a couple of friends, um, uh, Mike Shirtliff and Tom Ruscha. Uh, no, no, got it just backwards. Uh, Mike Rusche and Tom Shirtliff, sorry guys, uh, two of my closest friends. And we, we on our own, uh, decided that when it was our turn in the rotation to bless the sacrament, we would go down the hall before the meeting began and have our own little prayer meeting. And that was a really powerful experience. Um, years later as an adult, uh, when, when I was a bishop, I would, I would do that with, with the Aaronic priesthood that the boys that were going to be blessing uh, the, the sacrament, we would go off before sacrament meeting and have, have a prayer about that. So, so there are lots of things that we, that we can do. Um, you haven't asked me, but I'm going to give you one of my pet peeves. One of my pet peeves is when that wonderful member of the bishopric stands up in sacrament meeting and says, we are, we are now going to have the sacrament portion of our meeting. That, I just, that just drives me crazy. I feel like standing up and saying, there is no sacrament portion of our meeting. It's a sacrament meeting. The whole thing is supposed to reflect all the talks, all the hymns, everything in, in the ideal world reflects the fact that we've just, as a community, had this experience where we've shared with one another the emblems of Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, and everything ought to be an echo of that. I, I remember years ago uh, hearing John Staley. John Staley was a, a Benedictine monk for several decades before he joined the church. And then he was a sociology professor at BYU for a number of years. And he had wonderful insights into liturgy and the relationship between uh, Catholic tradition and Latter-day Saint sensibilities. And it, 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 it's just wonderful. Uh, and I can remember him talking about the significance, uh, what he thought is the significance in the way the sacrament is administered in Latter-day Saint congregations in contrasting it with the way it's done in a Catholic parish. And he thought both were great. He's not critical of, of either, but he, he pointed out um, the significance of the symbolism in a Catholic parish where one goes to receive the host and the wine, uh, the, the, the emblems of the Eucharist from the priest. And what a sacred moment that is. What that says 
about the role of the priest, what that says about the role of the parishioner, and it's a sacred bond there. It's really important. And then St- Brother Staley would point out, he would ask, okay, so who did you get the sacrament from last Sunday? And it's somebody sitting next to you, right? Might be a family member, might be a stranger, but it's nobody special. Uh, and he pointed out that that itself is highly special, that there's a, yeah. now, now, we all know, maybe the way we do it, the way we do it is because we're efficient, right? We're the people of the beehive, and we figured out the quickest way to get this thing done. That, that, that's the, uh, the skeptic's view of it. But maybe the lesson is what C.S. Lewis was teaching about the holiest thing next yeah, to That's where I was headed to. <clears throat> My favorite quote from Lewis is, I think, his greatest sermon, uh, The Weight of Glory at uh, St. Mary's Church. And you and I have been there together, and yeah. I tried to sneak up in the uh, pulpit uh, for where he stood and gave it. But he, he closes that by saying, next, the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. And in the Latter-day Saint form of taking the Eucharist, we get that, right? Because to my neighbor who's holy, I hand the emblems of Christ's suffering. That's a powerful. Yeah. So, 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 so one thing we can do is just become more sacramentalist yeah. uh, in that way. Yeah. Um, I think there's a reluctance to do that because we are, there's a lot of skepticism about uh, liturgy in, in our worship services. And I, I, you know, I guess I get that. I don't, I don't share those concerns. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's a powerful, that can be a powerful aid <clears throat> in centering faith and testimony and practice. On I'll tell you another one yep. that's related to it. It comes out of our experience. So I had this wonderful experience of presiding over a BYU campus stake. And that's great for many reasons. One reason it's really great is because nobody's really watching you. I mean, heck, no, I'm just kidding. No, I mean, uh, there's just certainly you're <coughs> being watched. There's supervision. But I can't, anyway, I can't imagine it's the same level of supervision. Well, maybe it is, but at least Elder John Groberg was the, the, the general authority who supervised us. And he was, what a wonderful man. The other side of heaven. To work, the other side of it. What a wonderful man to work with. And so uh, we presented to him an idea as a state presidency, and, and uh, he let us do it. Uh, and the idea was that uh, to lay down the law, lay down a rule. As my wife said, honey, you were the type of state president you would have hated as a bishop because you're laying down all these rules. But here's the rule we laid down, that every talk in sacrament meeting, every lesson in priesthood, Sunday school, Relief Society, all had to be about the atonement of Christ in a direct and an express way. So what that meant was if the bishop wanted to have um, a, a sacrament meeting on provident living, that's fine. That's fine great topic, but the talks had to be about provident living and the atonement of Christ. And what we'd say is, if you can't make that connection, then you either haven't thought about it enough, or what you're talking about probably ought to be talked about somewhere else, but not in sacrament meeting, not in the block of meetings that follows that, which are all supposed to to echo that. And so so we did that. uh, And I, you know, I just have to tell you, it was a remarkable experience. It was transformative for, for, for all of us. We really felt like we had stumbled upon something that's, that's powerful. And, and, and it, it, it took some administering to do. Um, we would have workshops regularly where we would teach teachers how to take the curriculum, the approved curriculum, and how to tease out of that um, atonement principles, how it relates to the atonement of Christ. I tell you, it, it, it changes Everything. So anyway, and so, I, so I have to believe that if, if we're having experiences like that, if if we come uh, to the Sabbath and the Sabbath and are having experiences like that connected to Christ and his atoning sacrifice, yeah, it doesn't, it, does, it, 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 it doesn't solve all of your discomfort, but it puts it's it, in that puts it in, per, puts it in perspective. <clears throat> yeah. I think that, more attention to our language could be helpful as well. Yeah. <clears throat> as you know, Fiona and I have spent a lot of yeah. time and space in print suggesting that, you know, if we think of Christ as our healer, yeah. um, it's about woundedness yeah. as much as about yeah. sin. If we think of sin as a form of woundedness, look upon him as yeah. the God who wants to minister to us rather than the God who stands in judgment over us. Yeah. Um, 
I, I just have found that there are so many members of the church who have a relationship to our Heavenly Father and to Christ that are <clears throat> uninformed by the beautiful truths of the Restoration. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think so much of what Joseph was doing was trying to move us forward in taking more literally a conception of, mm -hmm. of God as our Father. <clears throat> he's not the sovereign deity who's concerned about our obedience to him as much as he's... Um, I mean, here, here's an example. I just discovered this week, rereading for the millionth time, the beautiful Moses chapter 7, the encounter of Enoch with the weeping God. I had never noticed before, as God is talking to Enoch and Enoch asks him for the third time, why are you weeping? How can you weep? The father repeats the two great commandments, hmm. but he repeats them in reverse order. Really? He says, I gave commandment to, to, to my children that they should love one another and that they should honor me, their hmm. father. But they were without natural affection. Yeah. And right there. So what do you think that means? What is well, that flip? Well, what, when he describes his grief, he doesn't say they're ignoring me, they're disobeying right, me, they're right. rebellious. It's what not about him, him. It's not about him. Yeah. yeah. It's not about him. Yeah. What makes him weep is that they're they're killing each other. Yeah. And I think that's such a more beautiful conception of our father's relationship yeah. to us that that he's about us loving each other right. first and foremost. And if we think of atonement in the broader sense of reconciliation, well, recon what reconciliation? Right. At least trying to reconcile the human family to each other as yeah. well as, as to him. We, we had the really good fortune in our state back then of having a bishop who, who unfortunately did not, didn't stay with us for long because he became a general authority. <laughs> That's uh, uh, Elder Craig Christensen of the 70 was in our state. And he taught us something very profound about this when we started down this this path of focusing on the atonement um, and he pointed out that um, there are at least two components to the atonement what he would call the vertical pull of the atonement where where uh, our, our heavenly parents are pulling us to them through Christ and then equally as strong and equally as important is the horizontal pull of the atonement where they're trying to reconcile us uh, one to another, yeah. and and I I loved your emphasis <clears throat> on on the Christ who heals. Uh, that's been really helpful to me, and it helps explain an experience I had on my mission. Are we? Am I allowed to do that? Or am I allowed to tell yeah, sure. stories about my mission? Yeah, sorry, uh, uh, but I, I I served a mission in Southern Africa, and uh, I was in a, 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 a wonderful city called Durban, which is. Uh, on the coast of the Indian Ocean. Uh, Gandhi was actually from Durban. And so uh, uh, a, a f beautiful area um, um, that is about as diverse as certainly any place that I've ever been because you have, uh, you have uh, East Asians, uh, Southeast Asians there, uh, Southern Asians, you have uh, uh, Black Africans, Europeans, just a, 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 a real interesting mix of folks. And one day, um, it was preparation day, I was on the bus with my companion. We were going to the chapel. They had a squash court at the chapel in Durban. How did that get past uh, church real estate? But they had a squash court. And we were going to play squash that day on our preparation day. We're on the bus. The bus, for some reason, gets stalled in downtown Durban. So we're sitting there on this hot day. And I'm looking uh, out uh, over the, it wasn't a central plaza, but there was a large open area. And, uh, and it was just this incredible diversity of humanity. Saw so people in traditional African garb, people in European business suits, uh, the smell of, uh, of the spices. It was just very exotic. And I was sort of looking at that and thinking, this is how amazing is this that I'm in this part of the world having this experience. And then, and then the thought came to me. This doesn't happen often, but it, 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 it came to me. And the thought was um, Elder Griffith, Every person you see out there, and it was almost like, this wasn't a vision, but it was almost like they were representing every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, right? So every per, the, the thought was, every person you see out there hurts. They have pain. They have pain. They don't know how to reach that pain. With the message of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, you do. And I, I have to tell you, that changed my mission on a dime, 
up to that point in time, I was trying to be resourceful and coming up with interesting ideas to attract people's attention about the nature of the Trinity and, you know, continuing a revelation, all these sort of interesting things. But, but after that, um, I, I approached, I tried to approach every person I met with the assumption that there was something deep inside of them that really hurt. And, and I, I assumed that was true because I knew that was true for me. Right. Um, and, um, and it, it changed things it, it, with, with that view that people hurt and that Christ is the healer. It, it affects the way we approach everything. And I, and I think it gives us an answer to <clears throat> one of the deepest theological questions, which is, well, exactly how does that healing happen? You know, I think we sometimes, and I think President Nelson has warned against this. We sometimes objectify the atonement as this magical, right, genie's lamp. Right. And, and no, I, I think, at least this is how I experience it. But if you consider that when Joseph went into the sacred grove <clears throat> and, and heard that there was a problem with the creeds, I think the principal abomination to which the Lord was referring was this espousal of a God who's without passion, who's mm-hmm. incapable of being moved. I think replacing that with the God of Enoch, recognizing that we have a God who literally hurts over our pain. Mm-hmm. Um, Joseph's conception of creation, which is completely different, right, than the entire Christian tradition from Tertullian to John Piper, um, who says that God created us for our joy, not mm-hmm. for his glory. Mm-hmm. In other words, the more you you flesh out the nature of the God that Joseph reveals, the more you come face to face with a purity of absolute divine love right, right. that I think the Christian world has never successfully expressed or articulated. And it's although, although it's there, it's certainly there in the New Testament accounts, it's there in Hebrews, it's, you know, it's there in potential. He's, he's moved uh, the high priest who's, yeah, who, who feels what we feel, but, uh, and I don't know the theology, you're the expert there. I don't know the theology, but my experience uh, uh, may be a little bit different in this regard. And, and, and you, you tell me where the theology is. Um, all of my Catholic and evangelical friends view the God of Enoch. And I think of him in those terms, but they experience a God who weeps for that and cares for that. I think that increasingly yeah. has come to be yeah. the case. Yeah. That is that is undoubtedly a modern development. Okay. Yeah. It's undoubtedly a modern development. Every historian of theology will tell you that until the late 19th century, mm-hmm. nobody right. was embracing the idea of a God who can yeah. be moved by yeah. our, our pain or suffering. Yeah. So that's a new development. I, I'm reminded of the experience I had at a Methodist seminary in Baltimore where I was making essentially the same claims and a dean of theology objected strenuously. And he said, oh, we Methodists have been preaching that longer than Joseph Smith. And I said, well, are you familiar with your creeds? And he thought a minute and then got a little bit uncomfortable and said, well, we don't really pay attention to the creeds. So to the extent that at the popular level of lived Christianity, people have felt free to dismiss those creeds. I think they've been drawn to the true God. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of in, in your talk, your BYU talk, Lightning from Heaven, the story about Jonathan Edwards' wife. Right. right. Remind me of that story. Well, Jonathan Edwards was out of town, probably on a speaking circuit, and his wife, Sarah, was at home. And so the the, the equivalent of a home teacher stopped by, an assistant. A minister. Teacher, yeah. Another, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. And, and I could just imagine him thinking, okay, I'm home teaching Jonathan Edwards' wife. Yeah. I better do a good job just like he would. Yeah. So he, he asks her if he can pray, and he, he leaves this prayer with a family. And it just appalls her. It's a prayer to this sovereign, right, threatening kind of, that's the impression you get from her reaction. And she said, I was so disturbed after he left and I wondered why can't I address him as father? So I retired to my chamber to pray. And there appeared to me, God the Father and his son Jesus as two distinct loving beings that, I mean, she describes the experience as just transformative. I don't think it was a real vision she's, she's describing. She just had this intimation of a father figure completely unlike the one that... And don't, and don't you think that's natural? I mean, that's... Well, if it's not beaten out of us by culture... Yeah. And, and, and we are not immune from doing that either, right? Well, no. Yeah, we're not immune from 
Um, I mean, that's making Heavenly Father, making our Heavenly Parents maybe different than they they are. Right. Well, listen, we're running out of time. I, I do want to turn uh, to one topic that may seem unrelated to what's gone okay. before, but you insist that it's not. Okay. That is lawyers and the atonement. Right, right, right. Or just the general, um, what what you have titled at times in your remarks, I think, the, the, the Mormon approach to politics. Yeah. Is there a Mormon approach? Should there be a? I think there approach? should. I think there should. So this comes out of my, uh, I'm, from, I'm a native Washingtonian. I, I, on my mother's side of the family, the Bells go back to the Washington area to the 1700s. Laborers, farmers, artisans all. I mean, uh, but we go back that far. On the Griffith side of the family, uh, we go back to the Washington area to the 1820s or 1830s. So I am, I'm in the swamp. I am the swamp, right? Um, and I grew up... Um, with a fascination for national politics, um, living in McLean, Virginia in the uh, 60s and 70s. In those days, congressmen and senators actually lived in the Washington area because they, they could afford it. Uh, so they can't anymore. They, they can't afford to live there, so they don't. Uh, they just visit a couple days a week and then go to the home districts. But in those days, they lived there. So I went to, I went to school with the sons and daughters of Congressmen and senators, it was, it was that wasn't unusual, yeah. um, but developed a, an interest in national politics uh, early on. Had the wonderful good fortune um, of uh, being a neighbor to Mo Udall, who was a Democratic congressman um, from uh, from from Arizona and a, and a Latter Day Saint. Um, you've, got, he, you've got a great story he, with him and John McCain. Maybe you'll, I'll tell that. Tell that yeah. yeah. yeah uh, Mo, uh, by his own description, was a Jack Mormon. Uh, but uh, uh, his, uh, his, his father was a Supreme Court justice in Arizona, Stewart, longtime state exactly. president. Stewart uh, was his elder brother, was President Kennedy's secretary of the interior. Uh, the Udall family's a uh, remarkable uh, uh, family. And I had the good fortune of uh, living in the same neighborhood as him. And to make a long story short, uh, he hired me and I worked for him for a couple of summers uh, and uh, worked in his office in DC. He took me everywhere. Um, he would take me to press conferences. He'd take me to media appearances. And so here's a 15 year old. I'm rubbing shoulders with these national uh, politicians. And so uh, I had a, had a deep interest in, uh, uh, in, in, in politics. Um, at one point, uh, the plan was that I was going to, uh, I was going to run uh, uh, for Congress in Northern Virginia and Mo Udall was going to be in the district that helped me that, that a lot of things changed since then, including my political views. But, um, uh, but I was steeped in that uh, 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 culture. I, I remember on my mission, talking to my mission president about my interest in politics. And I adore my mission president, one of the greatest humans I've ever met, Robert Thorne. He was just baffled by the fact that someone could be interested in politics and, and, and also try and be a Christian. He, it just, it was just, uh, and maybe, you know, actually maybe he's right. I don't know, but, uh, uh, but I was, I, I was steeped in it. And so I followed it, um, uh, Carefully, never run for elective office, but I uh, was active in Republican Party uh, uh, politics before I became a judge. I, I no longer have any partisan affiliations. But as a result of all that, um, um, I have developed views about um, politics and public life and what the rest, what the restoration insights can and I think should bring to bear on public life and Latter Day Saints. And their role in public life. First of all, we ought to be there. Uh, I, I'm not a Benedict Option fellow that to retreat from society and and you know let it all go to chaos and then 300 years from now emerge with you know, saving civilization. I, I'm not glad the Benedictine monks did that. I don't think that's a model. Some temptation to do that. There is a constant temptation, but I think we're called to do just the opposite. I think we're called to be actively engaged in, in the life of the world. So, so the question is, how do you, you know, how, how do you, do, how do you do that? A Mormon approach to politics would be one where there is vigorous disagreement, but the primary objective, the primary objective is to build community and build unity amongst a, disper a diverse group of people. 
Okay, try this out. And I'm borrowing this now from Jack Welch. Okay. Uh, and the role Benjamin, King Benjamin plays, what, ben, what, what King Benjamin did. As Jack points out, if you, a, a close read of, of the Book of Mormon shows that Benjamin is really the towering figure, excuse the pun, the towering figure for Nephi society. His influence was long lasting uh, in, in many, many ways. Uh, Mormon starts his account after he, does, after he does the small plates, you got to do Nephi, he's the founder. Okay, Mormon puts the small plates in there. But now when it's Mormon getting to write his account for us, ben, who, who does he start with? He starts with an Enoch-like figure, city builder. It's Benjamin. And, and this again from Jack, a, a close read shows that Benjamin, Benjamin has this diverse population, right? He's got different ethnic groups. Got the Mulekites and, 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 and got and 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 got and, and, and Nephites, and they're very different. They're very different in terms of their educational background, their literacy. Uh, there's a big class divide. And, and as Jack points out, if you look carefully, the first part of the, the Mormon's account of Benjamin shows that Benjamin had spent his life trying to bring these people together through educational reform. As we get that from his description of how he taught his sons through legal reform, they did away with, um, uh, so it's like they did away with slavery and debtors prisons. Um, so it looks, this, the story, it looks like this is a man who's really tried hard to build, to bring his people together and it hasn't worked. And so what is it that brings it together? It's the speech, right? King Benjamin's address and, and the very center of that speech is about the atonement of Christ and its transformative power. And after that, they call themselves by the same, same name. So there's your model. There's your model. Now, you know, Mormon politi- Latter-day Saint politicians can't get up and give talks about the atonement of Christ in a debate. But we ought to be the ones who are working at unity. We are, we're the people of the beehive. I, I, I once heard Richard Bushman say this. Um, that of all the wonderful contributions Latter-day Saints can make to the world, and there, and there are many, we, we're, there are lots of great things we can do. He thought that maybe the chief among them would be, we know how to build community. That's, we know how to do that. So to me, a Mormon approach to politics would be one where we take those lessons that we learn and practice every Sunday at Ward Council. And uh, as we try and get along with our ward members who are different views. wards where we don't get to choose our neighbors. That's right. Eugene England's Why the Church is True is the Gospel. That as we learn the skills that come from life in the ward, which are so frustrating to us so that we want two hours instead of three. I'm sorry. had to put that plate. I'm a four-hour church guy. (laughs) I want four hours. Uh, we get, you know, we, we, we're sitting on top, but we're in the midst of this radical uh, social engine called the ward, and we sleep through it. We're bored with it. But what's happening there, I think, properly understood, is we, we're learning skills about how to build community that if we ever get to the point, and a lot of people are doing this already, where we take those skills, take them outside the chapel foyer, and start to work on them in our, in our communities, that's, that'll be trans- that, that will be transformed. And so, and so uh, I'm of the view, we, we, you know, we, 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 we believe that Latter-day Saints have a special stewardship with regard to the United States constitution. And there's, uh, there's talk out there. I don't know. I've never checked to see if the, how authentic it is, but there's talk that we, that there, that there'll be a moment when the constitution will be in peril and that we'll have some special role to say that, I mean, uh, a lot of people have spoken about that over the years. I don't, I don't, I don't pretend to know exactly what that means, but many interpretations I've heard in the past <clears throat> use that as a as a as a goad to people to study the Constitution, understand its history, understand its provisions, and I'm all for that. I'm all for that. But I think if there's a role for us to play in defending and supporting the Constitution of the United States and the principles upon which it stands, which are universal principles, that it actually comes in this community building because the Constitution cannot withstand a citizenry that's contempt with one another. It it was born in a moment where 
Um, I, I just gave a talk on this uh, yesterday at, at Berkeley, so it's fresh on my mind. That um, um, in the summer of 1787, the, the Constitutional Convention was about to fail. Um, six weeks later, it succeeded in his transmittal letter sending the Constitution uh, to the Congress, George Washington wrote that the Constitution was the product of the spirit of amity and mutual deference, which the peculiarity of our circumstances rendered indispensable. The Constitution was born because that group of people with all their flaws decided that they wanted unity above all else. They decided to compromise about the Constitution before they knew what the terms of the compromise were. It was the sense of unity that was primary. You know, we can do that. But that's that's what we, I think, so we're called. we have a place to play there. So, so that's my okay, thank Mormon you. approach to politics. Powerful. Two final questions. Sure. What inspires you with most hope at this particular moment in our own faith tradition? In our faith tradition, <clears throat> what inspires me with hope? Uh, well, first of all, I, I believe it's true. <laughs> I, I believe this movement, this church, is founded on a real miracle that, that to use David Bentley Hart's phrase, that, that history has been invaded by God in Christ in our time, in modern day, through this miracle of the recovery of the Book of Mormon and all that it stands for. So that gives me hope. I mean, to know God is active in the affairs of the world. And this is his, I believe, his primary vehicle, not his only vehicle. He's doing lots of great things through lots of different places, but his primary vehicle to prepare the world for the Lord's return. I, I, I believe that. So because of that, um, I'm... You're hopeful. I'm hopeful. Um, now, there's a lot that I'm discouraged about. It turns out... Uh, well, I thought that would tough. be too easy. Yeah, this is a tough time. Tough time. But. Second question, last question today. Um, holy envy. Of what tradition specifically, what practice oh, or gee. characteristics? I could go on a long time and you don't want me to do that. Pick I, one. I, 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 I'm going to pick two. I, so I tell my, uh, my Catholic friends, my Jewish friends, of, of whom I have many in there, bless my life in such profound ways. But I use this little phrase. I say, you know, if I wasn't absolutely convinced that there really were golden plates, I'd be at mass with you today. And I say to my Jewish friends, if I wasn't persuaded and convinced that something special happened on that Easter I'd be at synagogue with you. So I, I have holy envy for both those traditions, for Roman Catholicism uh, and for, for Judaism. I am a philo-Semite. Uh, and, 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 and there's lots about both traditions I admire, but I'll just pick one. I'll pick one. In both of them, they have displayed the power that comes from joining the life of the mind with the life of the spirit, right? And, and there's no false distinction between them. They're, they're, they're seamless. Uh, and I, I admire that. It, it's uh, because it speaks to the complete human, I believe. Yeah. Um, and, so I, and so both those traditions, I tip my hat to them. And, uh, uh, and we're getting there. You know, we're new. We're yeah. new. We're new at this. Uh, but we can learn a lot from, our, uh, from, from both those traditions. Thank you, Tom. As usual, you've been uh, eloquent and uh, powerful in, in your expressions. Well, I don't know about that, but I always enjoy talking with you. And uh, which we don't get to do as often now that I've now that you've flown located the here. And yeah, and we're still in Loudoun County, yeah. back east. But, uh, but thanks, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, this has been Terrell Givens with my close and dear friend Tom Griffith, who I've referred to more than once as the King's good servant, but God's first. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. So long. Thanks so much for joining us for this conversation with Terrell Givens. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, remember you can head over to our YouTube channel to watch a video of the conversation or to our website for a full transcript. 
If you'd like to support Faith Matters, we'd love for you to leave us a rating on your podcast provider or a thumbs up on YouTube. Thanks so much for listening, and as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.